go ahead and open our Bibles this evening to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 again. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 11. I'll read the text and we'll pick up where we left off last week. Paul writing here to Timothy, But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And tonight we come to the last of these statements here that Paul exhorted Timothy to pursue in his first epistle to Timothy. He started with righteousness, godliness. He moved from that to faith, then to love. Last week we saw to perseverance. And whenever we examined perseverance, we saw that it is a holy determination stemming from a knowledge of God and His will. And tonight, we're moving into that word gentleness. Gentleness. This particular Greek word that's used here appears only here in the New Testament. It has a root word, or the word we're more familiar with, that we get our English word meekness from, or that is translated, I should say, meekness. And it has that meaning of meekness. But before we get specifically into what it does mean, I want to mention for a moment some of the things this word gentleness does not mean. That it does not mean. First of all, it does not mean do not confront individuals with regard to their sin or to their false doctrine. It does not mean that. We know that from many places. One of them is, you'll find, and I'll ask you to move there with me for a moment, to Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Whenever you're going to Galatians 2, verse 11, if Paul was not exercising gentleness here, then he would be hypocritical, exhorting us to pursue gentleness in 1 Timothy 6, 11. But Paul here in Galatians chapter 2 gave an account of a time when he confronted Peter. Take a look at it with me. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11, But when Cephas, that is Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And he goes on to explain what situation brought that on. But notice there in verse 11, he said, I opposed him to his face. Paul did not jettison gentleness here. Not at all. He confronted Peter with the truth of his compromise and his sin. You can go in the same book from here to chapter 6 with me. Verse 1. Notice what Paul wrote here to the churches of Galatia. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, You who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Notice they're used here. It's a different Greek word, but it has the idea still of meekness. You restore them. In order to restore them, you're going to have to confront them with how they have steered away from God's truth. So, gentleness does not mean you do not confront someone because of their sin or their doctrinal error. First thing. Second, gentleness does not mean you do not contend. Look at the very next thing Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. The last thing he said in verse 11 was Timothy was to pursue gentleness. And the very next word in verse 12, is what? Fight. Isn't it that amazing? These two are held together here. Meekness or gentleness and fight. 
Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Paul of himself said in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. We have been looking at Jude, and in particular in verse 3 on Sunday mornings. And in Jude verse 3, we, he, we have the command that we are to earnestly contend for the faith. Right? So gentleness does not mean that we do not confront. It does not mean we do not contend. What does it mean then? If, if I could, from what I have seen in Scripture, give a definition of this word and what I have studied with regard to this word, gentleness is the poised spirit of a believer who, while under the influence of the Holy Spirit, understands through the Word of God that God is good and works all things in His life after the counsel of His will and together for His good as God conforms Him to the image or her to the image of Christ. So gentleness speaks to a spirit that is under the control of the Holy Spirit and has an understanding of the power of God in his or her life. Oftentimes, whenever we come to words like this in Scripture, we just want that little quick definition. I remember being in school, and in particular in the sixth grade, we had a teacher, and you probably had the same, who gave those vocabulary tests. And I learned real quick that all I had to do is flip to the back of the book, and there was a little spot back there that I could look at the word and see a brief definition. And it was pretty easy to do. I just memorized that little brief definition, put it down on the paper, and got 100 every time. thought, man, what a good deal. And it worked out pretty good, but those were very succinct definitions. Not that they were wrong, they were correct, but I didn't understand the volume oftentimes of the application of those words. And that's what's easy to occur here. We want a quick definition of a word, and that's important. But oftentimes, a word contains much more than a small, succinct definition. It's a combination of multiple things coming to bear. Someone has attempted to give a quick and succinct definition of the word meekness in Scripture, and they refer to it as power under control. Now, that would be very succinct because we're talking about Whose power? What power? Your own power. The power of God. The power of the Holy Spirit. Whose power? And it really applies to all of those things. And for that reason, that's why I say it is a poised or calm spirit of a believer who is under the influence or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And he is and understands through the Word of God, that God is indeed at work, working all things, according to Ephesians 1, verse 11, right? All things after the counsel of His will. What things does God work after the counsel of His will? All things. Nothing transpires in heaven or earth that is not being worked out after the counsel of the will of God. And that believer understands, as we mentioned from Romans 8, 28 and 29, that God is causing all things to work together for good to those who love Him and are called to according to His purpose. What purpose is that? Conformity to the image of Christ. That's a recognition of great power. And that's in the life 
of a person who has the spirit of gentleness, who is pursuing gentleness, who is following after gentleness. It's not a fear of fighting. It's not a fear or failure to um, confront, but rather it is, as we mentioned, a recognition of the work of the Holy Spirit in the light of the truth of God in a person's life, and that coming to bear in a circumstance. Very important for us. Now, we have some places in Scripture, I believe, that that's exemplified. We're all familiar with Job, but let's turn there for a moment. Job, I believe, in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of the book, Job exemplifies this, and he exemplifies it very specifically here before men, but also before God. Before God. In Job chapter 1, you're familiar with the fact that Satan, under God's direction, brought havoc into Job's life. He's, the text tells us, starting in Job 1.13, Now, on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkey feeding beside them. And the savings attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another one also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And I want you to look closely at verse 20, because here's another thing that gentleness is not. We could take it back to the New Testament as well. Gentleness does not mean we don't suffer. It doesn't mean we don't suffer. We do as Christians. Job was suffering here right now. Take a look at the text. The text says, Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. He suffered. He suffered the loss of his possessions. He suffered especially the loss of his children. He suffered. Paul talked of his own suffering. But the fact that he suffered didn't mean he wasn't gentle. Notice what Job did do, though. He fell to the ground and he worshipped. There was that gentleness and meekness. He worshipped God in the midst of of this great calamity. And notice what he said. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Amazing. He was exemplifying that meek spirit before God, wasn't he? Similar incident whenever you come to chapter 2, whenever the devil struck Job's body. He said in verse 10, speaking to his wife who had just said, why do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. He said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And we know later that 
Job actually said of the Lord Himself, Though He slay me, yet will I hope in Him. David was a man, the Bible says, after God's own heart. He was also a man of war. He said to God in one of the Psalms, You have trained my hands for war. David was noted for slaying in hand-to-hand combat tens of thousands of Philistines. Yet he was humble, meek before God. Take a look at a point in David's life whenever God's judgment was on David. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12. This is after David was confronted with his sin with Bathsheba. And sometime after that, the child that was born to her, as God said he would, died. Now, whenever you come down, and I'm going to ask you actually to jump to verse 24 with me for a moment. I know many individuals, whenever they come to First or Second Samuel chapter 12, and they look at the loss of this child, back up in verse 15, the text says, So Nathan went to his house, then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. Some believe that what happened is the child was born within days, maybe hours shortly after that, the child became sick and the child died. They need to understand that there are times when the Bible skips many years because it's conveying to us certain truths. And that's exactly what happens here. If you jump down to verse 24, you see the text, and it says, Then David comforted his wife, that's Bathsheba, and went into her and lay with her, and she gave birth to a son, and he named him Solomon. The Bible presents it to us similar here as it did back in verse 15. David went to his wife Bathsheba, he lay with her, and she had a child. No, there was nine months of time in between that. Solomon was one of multiple children that were born to David and Bathsheba after she had conceived and gave birth to her first child. And you can look over in 1 Chronicles chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5 and see that. But what's the point here? In this text, at this time, this child And by the way, that word child there in the Hebrew can be translated adolescent. As a matter of fact, the three Hebrew youths in the book of Daniel, the same Hebrew word is used to describe them as this child. The point is this. This child was born to David and Bathsheba. This child that God had told David, because of your sin, this child would die. And David saw this child live in their house with them and grow to somewhere, most likely, into his teenage years. In that time, there was a relationship that he built with that child. And then one day, that child became sick. Look at the text. Then the Lord struck the child that Uriah's widow bore to David so that he was very sick. David therefore inquired of God for the child. And David fasted and went and lay all night on the ground. He was praying for that child because he knew this was not an ordinary sickness. This was a sickness that would eventually, most likely, take this child's life. And he knew that. And why? 
because God years before told David, because of your sin, this would happen. Now David knew that God was a merciful God. So he cried out to God, and that's exactly what the text tells us. And we know the story how this child died. In verse 19, the servants said to David, after David said, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he came into the house of the Lord, and he worshipped. That's meekness. He didn't go in shaking his fist at God. He wasn't an angry man crying out to God and his fists in the air. Why me, O oh God? No, he knew why. And he worshipped God. I love the scenario here that is given to us. Look what it says. He washed himself. He got up from the ground. He washed, anointed himself. He cleaned up before he worshipped God. He changed his clothes and he came into the house of the Lord in worship. Then he came to his own house and when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this thing that you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious, and notice this, to me, that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will, not, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. I believe David saw in the life of this child a commitment of faith in the life of the child to God. And that's why he was able to say, he isn't coming to me, but I'll eventually go to him. David exemplified meekness there before God. Take a look to the book of Psalms. I believe that's a reference to Solomon there. Okay. Yep. Most, most likely, yes. Okay. Let's go over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, and move down in the text with me. Let's go to verse 68. Actually, back up to 67 with me. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Here is an exemplification also of meekness. Notice the psalmist here writes, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. He says in verse 68, and he recognizes that God is good here. He says, You are good and you do good. Teach me your statutes. Verse 68 immediately follows the fact that the psalmist acknowledged he was afflicted. How and by whom was he afflicted? He tells us. Jump down in the text of verse 75. I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have what? Afflicted me. God, you've afflicted me. Whenever Satan raised havoc in Job's life, Job ultimately knew and understood it was the sovereign hand of God working in his life. The psalmist here says in verse 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. Again, he is exemplifying gentleness, humility, and meekness before God. Take a look with me for a moment to 1 Peter. 1 
in First Peter, notice that overall context of this has to do, of this epistle has to do with suffering and trial. Look to verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, 1 Peter 1, 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Acknowledging clearly there are trials that are going on. Move from here in the text to chapter 4. Verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share in the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of His glory, you may rejoice with exultation. Suffering is in view. But notice what Peter says when you move to chapter 5. He points out in verse 5 that God is opposed to the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. And so what does He exhort us all to do? Therefore, He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time. And in verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. So whenever we're talking about the pursuit of gentleness, we're talking about the pursuit with regard to our own spirits being calm before God. Our own lives being under the influence of His Holy Spirit as we understand from God's Word that God is at work in our lives, working all things after the counsel of His will, and all things together for our good. And all of that, ultimately, to the praise of His glory and grace. That's a gentleness worth pursuing in our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we are grateful to you indeed for your many graces and mercy. We pray and ask that you would give us wisdom and insight in our pursuit of gentleness. And not only gentleness, Lord, but righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance. Bless us that our lives would reflect the meekness of Christ. In His name we pray. Amen.